So again, welcome to Inner Fitness and our topic today is, I believe, Slow Flow. Not to be confused with Flojo, Slow Flow. So that sounds rather odd and intriguing, but as always, let's start with a meditation. As I sit here, I turn my attention towards my own mind. That space inside where there is a constant flow of thoughts. Just observing the flow of thoughts in my own mind as clearly and honestly as I can, even for just a few seconds. And if I did not, the first time, the same exercise, ensuring that my physical eyes are open as I watch the flow of thoughts in my own mind. And after that short moment, what did I observe? I take note of what I saw in the flow of thoughts. And it seems to be the same for everyone. Checking the speed of those thoughts, the themes of the thoughts, and whether or not the physical senses affect that flow of thoughts. So the speed, the theme, which includes whether or not there is coherence from one thought to the other, or it changes themes mid-sentence, and also whether or not the physical senses in any way form what I think. This little exercise of observing the flow of my thoughts is very revealing to the self. Do I have complete mastery over the flow of thoughts in my own mind? Can I maintain a theme of thoughts at the speed I want while the senses are still open? Om Shanti. So slow flow is our theme. And as always, it's nice to, to enter into the theme looking at what slow flow might have to do with odor or physical fitness? What is slow flow about in terms of physical fitness or movement? Any thoughts? <clears throat> very quiet out there. It's a slow flow of activity. 
listen first and then speak. Very much about how we practically move through the world. It's a very wise idea. Slow things down. Mm -hmm. Gradual transitions. Gradual transitions. In movement, so it avoids mm -hmm. injury. To avoid injury. Mm -hmm. Taking care as one transitions. It's interesting this morning. <coughs> Um, we had two classes, two fitness classes, and they were really on seemingly opposite ends of the spectrum. One was very ballistic, uh, interval training, very quick speed of music, um, quite intense level of activity. And the other one was more of a Pilates yoga flow. So really, and there were many souls, about half the participants who took the first class stayed for the second class. So it was very interesting. And on the surface, they seemed quite different. Um, they actually had a deep connection in terms of the quality um, one would uh, experience in each one. But obviously in the second one, it was quite overt, this idea of slow flow. And I, I love these kinds of flow classes. But both of them, this idea of breaking down what is going on so that I can develop mastery and add quantity or speed at the end. But I want to break it down, slow it down, make sure I know what's going on. There's no problem with moving quickly. You know, I always think about that quote from Paramahansa Gurunanda, who was seen running for the train, and someone watching said, yogis don't run. He says they do if they're, they're trying to catch a train. <laughs> they do. But it doesn't mean that I lose that inner alignment, that quality of peace. <clears throat> that would suggest that that soul has done the work built up a strong foundation or mastery of their inner world so that they can add on that speed but always having to go slowly at first. So the second class, um, there's something that's been on my mind a lot. I heard in the class and I'm still trying to sort of figure it out myself. It's not that I disagree but I want to understand. But it, when we're talking about movement mechanics and these apply completely to spirituality. So you can see if you can figure out what this would look like spiritually. But there's four elements. And we like to focus on the last one, which is power. But the four elements are first mobility, then stability, then strength, and then power. So in fitness, this is what's being suggested, is that this is the order. And the reason, of course, that everyone ignores mobility. No one really likes doing range of motion work. So, but mobility is suggested to be the foundation. So even, you know, if I'm an Olympic lifter, I'm going to do a squat. And the way you usually rack the bar is like this. With your elbows for try this even without a bar, just give it a try. So my hands have to the bar, imagine the bar is resting on my clavicle. So I'm holding the bar, imagine it on here, this heavy, heavy bar. My elbows have to be up in front of me, parallel, and my hands are holding the bar. Elbows are parallel in front. How are we doing? How's that feel? Okay? Okay, now try standing up and doing the same thing, elbows in front. So imagine this is a heavy bar, right? Right now we're holding air. Now trying to squat. Try and squat. Keep your elbows in front of you and try to squat. Elbows are pointing forward rather than to the side. Pointing forward and squat. 
Keep your elbows in front. How's that feel? How's that feel? <laughs> in a sorry, how does that feel? Have a seat. That's your workout for today. But what they do is they'll warm up their wrists, they warm up their shoulder joint, they warm, they get mobility. Many can't do it, and so they have to, the classic, they'll rack it on their back. They simply do not have the range of motion even to be able to rack the bar. And then of course the second piece is stability to maintain this mobility while in movement. So we have mobility, stability, then strength, then power. Now the first class, which was interval training, has a huge power focus. So they're just focusing on power. The tip of the iceberg, there's all this work underneath that may or may not be on their radar. Mobility, stability, and strength may or may not be on their radar. They're just going crazy. But the second class was really lovely because they get to slow down and work on the mechanics or foundations of the movement. And so, you know, one of the things that we tell them is about transitions. There's going to be transitions during the class. And usually people just collapse during transitions. So they'll be holding a posture and then we're going into another posture and rather than transition, they just collapse and set themselves up in the second posture. That's usually, and my feeling is all the gains are in the transition. This is the benefit of doing a flow. All the gains are in the transition. Being able to do a controlled transition from one movement to another with absolute grace, so we use the term with complete dignity, to be able to do that transition with so much control. There was one soul in the room and um, it was a really, it's a really, it's a challenging transition that they had to do. And so I'm sitting here talking them through and I'm watching her and I could just see this incredible spiritual <laughs> sort of exercise going on. She was willing the body not just to transition, but to transition with dignity, with right alignment. It takes remarkable control. And I think it's very often dismissed because it doesn't look like much is going on, but that's where the gains are, is being able to maintain mobility and stability whilst in movement, in transition. This maps on a lot to spirituality, this idea of slow flow or controlled movement. You know, as we, even the simple, simple thing of being in seated meditation, <clears throat> having a very nice, peaceful, blissed out experience, and then transitioning into sound. And souls will say again, again, there's a difference in the quality the minute I come into sound. So I'm not able to hold that alignment that I had, that level of peace, I had while seated or in a cave, I can't seem to hold it, transition it into another context or posture, another, another environment, coming into sound or movement. That to me is the essence of spirituality, to first establish the alignment in silence and then be able to hold it, or we say integrate it, hold it as I come into sound. That transition is everything. And I was, as I watched this soul do this crazy transition, it was actually from a side plank to a high plank without touching the floor, coming down on their torso. Um, the, the, you know, just watching them, what it took for them to keep their alignment as they transitioned was so powerful to witness. It really reminded me of what we need to be doing internally to maintain this amazing flow, this slow, controlled flow from one context to another, and what throws us off. So if I looked at mobility in terms of spirituality, what do you think mobility looks like in spirituality? Mobility means range of movement, by the way. able to 
be in a state of integrity no matter what situation. Like mm -hmm. You can adapt, you can move. So, so that's, freedom. yeah, that's really connected to stability, actually, mm -hmm. be able to maintain that, mm -hmm. that integrity. Absolutely. The, the movement experts are suggesting mobility comes before, which is interesting. So what would be mobility? Stability definitely is maintaining that integrity, that spiritual alignment. What is mobility? What is moving me, spiritually speaking? It's exactly what it sounds like, able to move into that alignment. Oh. <laughs> Souls are absolutely stuck right. in a certain awareness. They are stuck. We see this um, physically. Souls have been sitting physically a lot, and they've gotten stuck. Their hip flexors are stuck. Their joints are stuck. So movement is more challenging for them right now. I, I know one of the main things physically I was paying attention to in my own regime was stretch and flexibility, really, because I could tell sitting and many as a result are having different aches and pains because of getting stuck. <laughs> I'm not looking at anyone in particular, but because of getting stuck. So even just being able to move into a spiritual awareness is a challenge and this is this lines up with the subject that we call knowledge in this study you mean like shift my awareness is that what you mean yeah being able to move yeah mm -hmm. to be able to move from no i'm stuck i'm stuck in certain ideas i'm stuck in certain beliefs i'm stuck in a certain awareness and i am not moving at all <laughs> <laughs> and it, it got more than attachment it's a, yeah i'd say a lot of attachment absolutely really really we get so stuck and we often try and surround ourselves with people who keep us stuck we like to do that a lot uh, people who have the same beliefs the same ideas the same attachments if you will um so that it, sort of we reinforce our stuckness for each other <laughs> And so I'm very touched when souls walk into a fitness class, which is outside their zone, their so-called comfort zone. I think that's really courageous. And really, the first step for many is just to walk through the door of, for example, a Brahma Kumari Center. Some part of them knows they're going to encounter different ideas. And it's really, there has to be a timing, a readiness for many people in terms of fitness, they don't look at mobility work until they're injured. And the same applies in spirituality. Many do not walk through a BK center until they're in emotional pain. So we, we get so attached, so stuck to something that is quite self-destructive, but we don't know it. And even if we did, we're not sure what to do about it. We're not sure whether there are options we have. So obviously, if I'm using the example of Raj Yoga, the first shift, the first movement we're trying to get going on is the deepest one, which is the same in terms of fitness, but we're trying to shift awareness. This idea that this deep belief, habit, paradigm, that thinking I am a body, uh, I am this physical thing, I am all this physical stuff. We are stuck there. It's causing tremendous pain. Trying to shift it, to move it to I am not the body, I am the being inside the body, the thinker. That little shift, it's a huge shift, that mobility which does require a release. You can say that and go, but a release is huge. I mean, it gets so bad for many, they're having to go to Cairo and all sorts of release therapies because they can't release it themselves. This is the physical body. The same happens spiritually. What will it take? Shifting from negative to parking, walk through the door with love. Yeah, exactly. I mean, these are all things that need to happen, but they're very challenging for us to do.
even though we know what we need to do, for us to actually do it is so difficult. We've talked about it so many times here that if you go up to someone and say, you've got to let go, they say, I know I have to let go. I can't. I don't know how. I can't seem to let It's still stuck in my head. So with spirituality, the first subject matches up with mobility, the subject of knowledge. Through knowledge, I'm able to start to let go, to shift. Understanding has huge, huge impact. And I remember at the end of the class, uh, one of the ones who took both, and after the second class, which was the flow class, they said, you know, it's really quite remarkable that when you're in a class with the instructor queuing, it's a completely different ball game. Like completely, like I, I can't, I'm not doing anything right. <laughs> like was what they came up with, like there's so much I need to shift in terms of what I'm doing. Like there's just so much alignment. That, so to receive understanding, just as in physical, the moment that things start to be explained and finally understood, they kind of go in in a way that's meaningful, I can start to shift, start to let go, start to have that love, that understanding. But I need to have some kind of information go in there that will unlock the stuckness. Understanding has huge power. So when I say mobility in physical fitness, it in some ways matching, mapping onto the first subject in spirituality, which is understanding of spiritual knowledge. This is really, it starts to get things moving. It's, it even is just learning about my other options. You know, this is a huge one on the planet right now. There's a lot going on that it's always been this way, but it's becoming very loud that focuses on identity. A lot of things going on on the planet right now that's all around identity. And I don't you know, want to get political or anything, but I think I can safely say, because it's out there, an example would be Black Lives Matter. That whole thing is around an identity. So a lot of things going on, on the planet are around identity. We want to shift it, we want to unlock it, we want to find solutions, but the only f material we feel we have to work with is physical identity. And so how to you know, make that shift, what kind of understanding, if you will, other options do we need so we can really do something different rather than expect something different while doing the same thing. So how to move you know, that first topic of movement, mobility. And then we come to the second one, stability. <laughs> so the actual practice, if you will. So I know now what I need to do and I completely get it and I understand it and sometimes I might even feel it, but I'm not stabilizing there. I touch that deep piece of spirituality, but it, it kind of comes and goes, as he says, that integrity in different situations isn't there. So how do I, what, what kind of deep stabilizers do I need to activate? And luckily for us, uh, in spirituality, in Raj Yoga, the deep stabilizer is actually another being. <laughs> so the thing that helps to anchor or stabilize us, which most of us are using far too little, is our connection with a spiritual being. I'm trying to, to become, to, to understand this experience. I'm a spiritual being. There is someone available who's always in that state. If I connect to that one, it's like a brace. It really provides that integrity. So stability roughly connects to the subject of yoga, that connection to a being who's in that alignment all the time. And I've seen this so much, the power of yoga, so much in a physical fitness class. It always never fails to blow me away. But if you look in a class, and, and I've experienced it as a substitute teacher, it's really interesting. If you look in a class and you look at the instructor, the bulk of the students look like the instructor. Their execution is the same as the instructor. 
So when I go to do a substitute class, and I'm meeting the students for the first time, I can tell from what they're doing what their instructor is like. Because the yoga, this how we're colored so much through that relationship of student, teacher, mentor, disciple, whatever you want to call it, we're so deeply colored by that. It really affects where we stabilize. And again, we're all yogis, you know, but what am I having yoga with? Is it relevant to where I'm trying to go? Is the question. So this effect of there's a being who's completely stable, always, the minute I have a meaningful connection, I, I feel my, completely myself. That's the sign you're actually in yoga with the Supreme Soul, is you feel your pure, real self. This is very different from devotion. When we prayed and cried out to God, we didn't feel pure or real. We felt like a devotee, felt like a worshiper. This is very different, and this is what I need to check. When I'm connected to that being, I, for that moment, I am stabilized. This is why he says, remember me as much as, much as possible. The not you bits, uh, just out of lack of use, they're gonna fall away. Remember me as much as possible while you walk, move around, act, interact. Because every time, if it's a meaningful connection, you'll notice every time I connect to that being, I feel myself. I feel real, elevated, pure, and ever I connect to that being really accurately. So that's like my stabilizer until I start to develop strength right? That's my stabilizer, my brace. So what's strength? I was mixing up strength and power. There's, no, there's all so connected. I, as, as she was saying this, I thought, my goodness, just like the four subjects, we don't really, they kind of work together, but they do kind of unfold in a certain order. You know, if strength is matching up loosely with our dharna subject, what does strength look like spiritually? Capacity to be a certain way, respond a certain way, mm -hmm. behave mm -hmm. a certain way, mm -hmm. decide a certain way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way we actually start to operate, our natural nature is starting to shift. So I have noticed that when I do certain core stabilizer classes, these tend to be body weight, they tend to be slower, they're very mindful classes, I notice my strength in other applications increases. It's actually changing how the body operates on a very deep and natural level. Dharna is my natural nature is changing. I'm not trying to be a certain way. It's literally my natural nature is changing because of the time I spend in yoga. So I'm starting to develop strength, a natural nature. So I start to naturally think this is this is why we say the worst insult you can give a BK is, oh you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> because of course I'm here to tran to change, to transform, to for my original state to gain strength become natural. So this natural nature. This might be a, a useless question, but is there a reason why? I, I don't know if you can answer because I mean it's my disconnect. Why mm -hmm. I would mix up strength and power. You know, when I think of strength, the process of building up the stable mind, absolutely. So a very strong mind is included in this. Um, when I think of, of power, to me, I mean, we're going to match it up with the the mm -hmm. service topic, and that's when things go really interesting in spirituality uh, and fitness. And you'll notice that the one subject that's super confusing to us is service. So I want you to think about what is confusing about service, and it will say a lot about power. What is it about service that makes us a little apprehensive? It's not. Well, we're going to use that word so it's going to put us who join and what we're talking about. Benefit, we're going to use that word, mm -hmm. benefit. Mm -hmm. But what makes us nervous about service? Because it's not real benefit. <laughs> when you're, when you're doing what, it. Whether we're actually serving. Then you're actually serving your ego. Exactly. Self-respect would be strength. If you don't have that strength, 
and you try to do service, it's going to go really sideways. So I see people trying to do power moves and they're violent moves. They're ballistic they're moves. They're strong. doing in physical fitness. I actually think they're doing damage to themselves because we have conceptions of power that are very, very superficial, just as we have concepts of service that are very superficial. Right. So I think it just, you know, when you map it on the subjects, it starts to kind of make sense. So when we're in the class today, you know, these mind body classes, the one we taught today, they tend not to be very popular because souls feel they're not going to get powerful. They're not really doing a workout. There's nothing going on. And this particular class, we ended with a meditation. So they really think it's just, you know, a, a lazy person's class. And I, rem I took both classes. I came out of the first class feeling beat up. I came out of the second class feeling powerful. Interesting. Yeah. And you could tell from those who took both, there was a world of difference in terms of their stage after the second class. They, they had to have incredible strength and all of it to be able to do that second class. They had to, and they did extremely well. But you could tell they came out of that second class powerful, but very different from the first class. The first class you'll feel beat up. And that's our concept of power. So this whole disconnect, I was thinking with the disconnect, mm -hmm. thinking that they're one and the same, is perhaps maybe superficial ideas of what yeah. power is. Because I didn't get the other pieces in place. So bringing it to the idea of slow flow, I love slow flow fitness classes. I love them. And I love flow. I'm, I, I know static sometimes, but I actually prefer flow. Even when I'm stretching, it will be this constant flow. I love it because there's subtlety. There's, there's building up these capacities at a very subtle level. The more subtle it is, the more powerful it is. And we get this in terms of science. We know that things that are concentrated and subtle and small, such as the atom, are really powerful. We know that essence will concentrate equals power. Works the same with the body, and it definitely works the same in spirituality. So with the body, if I can develop a very subtle awareness, get my alignment at very subtle levels, get you know, control, you know, understand the movers, the drivers of mobility at a very subtle level, I am developing true power. So I love slow flow classes. People have no, it's very deceptive when people watch it. They have no idea how much it takes to control your body in a slow way. It takes remarkable control to be able to do that, to maintain your alignment, especially when you're talking about sort of different, very unusual postures to be able to maintain your alignment through that it takes incredible all four of those subjects. You've got to have all four. So in spirituality as well, although they kind of unfold in an order, they very much start to work together. So I need an understanding that enables me to move. We're constantly using knowledge to be able to move us into soul consciousness. We're constantly moving it, as, you know, using it to move into spirituality. Oh, I strayed from spirituality. I need to move. We got so stuck in physicality, so stuck. We're just fused there. Mm -hmm. Is there, so both physically and spiritually, can one tell that there, um, that there is no strength? It may be perceived as power. Yeah. But you don't want to wait until there's an injury. I was going to say pain is always the sign. Yeah, but there must be. <laughs> you could hire a trainer mm -hmm. who helps you if, you, if you're honest enough. Um, but it's going to, unfortunately, it often will have to wait till injury. Mm -hmm. yeah. And spiritually speaking, I guess it's the same thing. Wait till pain. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, it's a very subtle pain sometimes called disinterest. Mm -hmm. it's, just not, it's just not working. It could be a subtle pain, restlessness, disinterest. Something's missing, but something is going on inside that's propelling me to move beyond the fear of change. Mm -hmm. So we have here build up the strength to let to go to the natural way of staying in a stable mind. Absolutely. You know, and again that strength is is on a subtle level. Very subtle things need to be happening. So he's going to come back to that core stability 
being able to move. And, and the reason mobility, I think, you know, for me, we've been talking about this so much. We know what we have to stabilize. We know we want to stabilize in soul consciousness. We really struggle with moving into that state, really struggle of becoming soul conscious. This is so, so stuck. And I think if we accept it, it'll be a whole lot easier for, you know, especially adult learners. We've talked about this when they have certain mechanical habits. It's very challenging for those habits to not fire whenever they do the movement. You know, you're trying to get some other mechanics to fire. It's very, very hard to move out of those mechanics. So, you know, I'm working with some clients and they're just super tight, super fused. And my, one of my favorites, I get this a lot, is you ask them to, um, to sort of, you know, they kind of, when they're sitting, they're kind of slouching and releasing. So you say, um, you know, let's turn on that lower back and lift the sternum. And this is always what I get, when, especially when I say lift the sternum, I get this. It's like so, the, 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 this isn't really the movement that we're looking for. You know, we really want deep stuff to go on, but I, I may not know how, I may not know what you want. I, even if I do, I'm not sure I can actually feel it happening. So when we say become soul conscious, there is a lot involved that we can miss because we don't realize how stuck we are. So that first one, or just that mobility piece is huge to be able to move out of physicality. I'm always touched at how big that is, the mobility piece, to be able to release. To say I am a soul is massive detachment. We love to jump ahead to the other stuff. We love to. We'll do anything in our power to skip over soul consciousness, it appears, you know, because it's so challenging for us to figure out. But everything depends on it. Like, I'm not really doing the other stuff. I'm doing it in a body conscious way, I guess. But I'm not really, I'm not really doing spirituality. So this movement, to be able to release that much, go into the experience, I really am a soul. And we know we're there because we have so much movement. You see, it's the attachment that's causing the pain. Just as souls who are very tight and fused experience a lot of pain physically. Now, I don't want to be super mobile. I'm going to need the balancing of that stability and strength. But it's remarkable when souls physically, their body, you know, so many talk about back pain and it's a really interconnected problem due to certain mechanics, uh, tightness, yes, loss of strength as well. There's a lot going on, but it's very challenging to shift those mechanics to release the spine. So it's, uh, it's really, we're really kind of stuck in physicality, deeply stuck. And it is no small, I never, I never underestimate. I, I hear souls say, oh yeah, so I became soul conscious. I was like, really? And then I wait for the rest of the sentence and say, what you just said, it has no indication that you became soul conscious. That's so interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's really having to check, have I mastered that? movement because that's going to be the centerpiece of slow flow of mastery being able to maintain that stability as i move through situations it becomes natural i want you to think of uh, the masters of slow flow flow are ballet dancers i want you to bring into your mind a ballet dancer and probably the first thing you see is that posture right that incredible posture that never seems to turn off it's become their natural nature. It gets so hammered into a dancer that it, they can't stop, right? It's become their natural nature. That dharna of a certain alignment is now there that really should be there for everyone, right? Not just ballet dancers, but I mean, posture should be there for all of us, right? 
so that royal posture so this control this slow flow in movement and this capacity to maintain my peaceful stage as I move through the world to not become if you will reactive or upset um, depends on having these pieces in place and eventually they all merge into one and I think it's that final one which we'd call power we're able to move through the world powerfully but it's not that very old idea of power you know when I when I see someone physically moving <laughs> through the power you know we see someone you know, the classic bodybuilder with the big muscles and the muscles on the muscles so wow they look really powerful they, they can't even lift their arms over their head like there's no mobility whatsoever see we wouldn't think of the mobility as being powerful no no you know and, and we and it's the same spiritual <laughs> spiritually and you know, we think oh they're so giving they're so generous and then two hours later they're yelling at their wife right where is that coming is it coming from the right alignment or is it coming from image and ego and attachment because it will eventually blow up right just as those powerful souls i mean they have so many injuries it's frightening yeah i guess it's interesting i mean again moving from physicality to spirituality so not to get stuck in physicality that we never think of mobility stability strength and power as you know, a common a com combination mm -hmm. of what is powerful i think that's maybe why i was like i think that's strength and power are the same thing there yeah. must be some sort of disconnect yeah then i guess in a sense same thing in terms of spirituality when we're learning about these four subjects of raj yoga we we kind of look at them in disconnected ways mm -hmm. again our ideas of power mm -hmm. like when you were saying like mobility I'm like really what does that have to do with power like mm -hmm. there's there's i know that's what i'm talking about physical but yeah. like, there's a disconnect and we can't see it. yeah you know i remember doing track and field and i was really lucky although i don't think my trainers or instructors thought I was lucky, but it's just the way things turned out that we were put in athletics, so sprinting, but we're actually also put in ballet classes. And the trainers of those don't like you to do that. So my ballet teacher did not like the fact that I was doing track and field. And the track and field people just thought my ballet classes were interfering with everything. You know, they say, you're floating over the hurdles, you're floating. <laughs> it's just, but from my perspective, they went together so well. You know, ballet is all about alignment, mobility, range of motion, and that strength, being able to develop a very natural way of maintaining. It becomes a way you move. And to be able to carry that over, much less prone to injury. You know, I watch the runners, the sprinters now, and I'm going, they must be doing mobility work. I mean, their, their gait is beautiful. The, the range of motion in their gait, you know, now it's all about how relaxed can I look sprinting down the track, you know. I mean, you can just see this influence of that mobility, that stability. It, it so enhances the power. Track and field is all about power, right? The power of moving down. And they, they look like gazelles. They're beautiful to watch. I mean, they're starting to almost move into dance. Really, they're quite... Now, when they don't, when they get tense, we can see what happens. You know, I've seen... I, the other day, I saw a race, and, you know, 50 meters in, he pulls his hamstring as he's charging down the track. Um, it is huge, the marriage of those subjects. Someone who's really, you know, wise will not leave a side. And I, I know I see so many who will just focus on one component and eventually it will lead to injury spiritually or physically mm. in both scenarios um so it's so you know the runners who just stretch and stretch and stretch and do core work core work core work because then they can forget about it because it's become natural it, you know they need such efficiency of movement 
for that power just as we need efficiency for service it's going to be through the mind there is no room for a single waste thought single waste energy there's no room a sprinter who's going to get down to the other end under 10 seconds there is no room for inefficient movement so their alignment has to be as you watch them you're seeing if they've got that swaying side to side they're already losing time the ones who are just alignment tons of core stability they're just streamlined you know so that this it's become natural because they only have 10 seconds they can't go through a checklist minute they're out of there it's got to be there everything the mobility the stability it's all got to be there so they're just sheer power so basically in a second is this that you're already on it's yeah. not really that you go something no. shift into a position no. in a second. you're already on. you're already there it's become your dharma your natural nature is that core you know and that's what i always hope for because i know for example when i travel a long flight in a plane i hope i've got enough physical dharma that will keep it together in that really perhaps uncomfortable <laughs> scenario of sitting in a a seat for a long time whatever the case so you want it just there you just want it on so I can see that we might be coming to the end of our time I don't know how much that was with slow flow it was more about something that's been on my mind um, but I do welcome your thoughts if there's any thoughts or you want to share or ideas deep in reflection. We can go into reflection. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that now. <laughs> I go back inside and again watch the flow of thoughts in my mind. And I reflect. How does a peaceful being think? What is the movement of the mind for someone who is naturally peaceful? How do they think? What would be the flow of thoughts for someone who is naturally peaceful, always in that stage? How would they think? How does one get to that state? If we believe that true peace, that inner stage of peace, is the result of a spiritual endeavor, my starting point would be spirituality. That is, experiencing myself to be spirit. Feeling that detachment from the old way I thought of myself, which was body. That I am an eternal being, which means nothing temporary can never truly be mine. I am not physical like the body, but I am energy, I do exist. I'm very unique energy called living energy, soul. I can think and feel, understand, remember, experience and express. I exist even after the body perishes. I am a point of consciousness, awareness. If I honestly go into this experience, there automatically is peace how to stabilize there. I need to remove all the old habits. 
hearts so only the truth remains and that's what yoga is for to melt away all the old habits all the illusions connecting to a being who's always in that true alignment it's remarkable the effect truth has on the soul and if I maintain that alignment while thinking and seeing and speaking and acting it starts to become more and more natural I start to feel more and more peace through the day power is when it becomes my natural constant way of life the power to remain peaceful even in a peaceless situation to stay light to stay true to think as a peaceful being would think constantly it all starts with moving into soul consciousness spirituality Om Shanti Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for your contributions. Hmm. Next week. No idea what the topic is, but we'll be here. So perhaps you will join. That would be lovely. And until then, do take care of yourself. Continue with your inner exercises, whatever they may be. And until we meet again, Om Shanti, thank you very much for joining.